Uh, we don't have uh, the term Bible that we are so used to uh, did not exist before uh, the ninth century in reference to a fixed collection of books. Though Jerome in the early fifth century spoke of uh, Ta Biblia, which is the books, and he was referring to the books that were sacred, and he had a list, but the lists themselves varied for uh, centuries, right on up until the 19th century, by the way. Uh, we sometimes forget, uh, we think that everybody, because today all major Christian groups, the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Protestants have the same New Testament, that wasn't true initially and for centuries. Welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. Hello, I'm Rick Jordan, president of Great Bible Teachers. Regularly, I have the opportunity to interview scholars, authors, and church practitioners about the Bible, biblical interpretation, or spiritual formation. Today, I'm very pleased to present the interview that I had with Lee Martin McDonald. Dr. McDonald, or Lee as he asked me to call him, is a very experienced uh, professor with many writings, over 30 books, as well as books that he has edited and many, many journal articles. He is particularly known for his work in the canon, how the Bible came to be. We know that the Bible didn't just happen, but there's a lot of mystery about how the Bible came together. And so I asked Lee to help us unweave some of those mysteries and uh, we end up with still a lot of mystery, but a lot more understanding about how the Bible came to be. So I hope you'll enjoy this interview. Uh, Dr. McDonald, Lee, thank you for joining us on Great Bible Teachers today. Thank you. It's a delight to be with you. Well, I've really looked forward to this. Uh, I've been reading your book. You have a new book out um, through Westminster, John Knox. I'm going to try to show it. Sometimes Zoom does, you know, like that, makes it disappear. But um, Ancient Jewish and Christian Scriptures, and uh, you and a couple of other scholars have worked together on putting this book together. Uh, and we'll talk about the book itself, but I always begin the interviews by asking uh, our interviewee about their own pilgrimage a little bit and who has been a great Bible teacher in your life and why would you describe them in that way? Well, there, there are several, of course, uh, in my journey that I have greatly appreciated. Uh, one was uh, a seminary professor I had years ago, George Ladd, who wrote uh, Theology of the New Testament. Uh, he had a remarkable way. He never uh, uh, gave lectures in the classroom. He gave all of his writings out to the students ahead of time, and uh, some of them was like 500 pages, but uh, then he would spend the class time interacting with you and sometimes spending a full half an hour, 45 minutes with one student. And uh, he asked questions that forced us to think, and he taught me how to read a book. And I, I never uh, ask the question about what is the author's presuppositions and is the author consistent with those throughout his exegesis or interpretation of the text? And uh, what were the strengths and weaknesses of it? If you ask me what did the author say, I could say it very easily, but I never analyzed it or assessed it. And that's what uh, learning how to read uh, critically is what Ladd was excellent at, as well as quite good in the classroom. Uh, my doctor uh, father in Edinburgh, Scotland, was uh, superb. He had a, a grasp of the uh, details, uh, the subject matter. He didn't open his mouth without knowing. And if you ever wanted to contradict him, which I did one time, I learned to I learned my lesson well. Uh, <laughs> I. I mentioned that he was inconsistent with something that he wrote earlier. And uh, he said, uh, Mr. McDonald, when did I write that? And uh, I said, 1963, sir, Oxford University Press. And he said, now that was seven years ago, wasn't it? And that's all he said and went on with his lecture. 
I, I learned my lesson that scholars can change their minds now and then, but he was superb with a grasp of knowledge and ask again, probing questions that I hadn't thought of. And uh, rather than trying to examine me on whether I know all of the things that they've said in their lectures or written in their books, they had a remarkable way of going beyond that and uh, helping me rethink uh, some of my assumptions and prejudices that I hadn't thought uh, were that way. Helmut Kester at Harvard was the same way and so was George McRae. I had them both as professors and uh, both examined my uh, thesis uh, there. And uh, uh, we became friends. George, uh, George McRae died shortly after I graduated at Harvard, but uh, I uh, stayed very close with Helmut Kester for years. And uh, he never asked me to believe anything that he said or that he believed but he would share with me as much as he possibly could and then give me the options of which direction I wanted to go in. And I thought that was a, a, a very good strength. He was an excellent professor. Uh, he never came to class unprepared that I know of. And uh, he had a remarkable way of asking questions that uh, I had not considered. And so uh, I've seen the cognitive dump truck model where a professor backs up and dumps it all on the students and they're just told to memorize it, but they never have to think through it and give an assessment of what it is and why they've chosen one view as opposed to another. And that's a, the part of the goal of education is not accumulation of information. It's learning how to think through the information to assess it, analyze it, and make choices. If you can't make a choice, you don't belong in a leadership role or in a classroom leading the class. So that's kind of my background in that area. Wow, that's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing some of your story with us. You have a lot of expertise in, in, in the Bible and in the formation of the Bible. You've written a great deal about it. And this, this book, one thing I like about it is that uh, it seems very accessible. When the Bible writers were writing, so, you know, Matthew is jotting down the Sermon on the Mount, uh, or Paul is writing a letter to Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. Um, did they have in mind, now, I am actually, what I'm doing is writing scripture, like, like the Old Testament, well, they didn't call it Old Testament, but they knew of some scriptures, sure. but were they thinking I'm I'm writing something akin to like what Moses books are? Uh, not at all. And uh, as you probably are aware, there is a, a New Testament scholar who's written uh, a couple of books in that area trying to advocate that position. But uh, there's too many questions and problems with it in the text that he uses uh, to support that uh, really don't make an awful lot of sense. Now, the Gospels from the get-go, they functioned authoritatively uh, in the early churches because they focused on Jesus, who was the Lord of the church. And yet no writer of the New Testament calls his own writings scripture. And I try to underscore that uh, before we start making decisions about that, it's the second century churches and later that uh, recognize those writings as scripture. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I've often cited the, uh, the text in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 17 and 18, he's been boasting, and then he says he is not writing kata kurion according to the Lord, uh, but according to the flesh, kata sarka. If a person is writing scripture, to what extent is he writing according to the flesh? And then he says what he's actually doing in chapter 12, uh, verse 11 and following, he says, I must boast because you folks are really kind of arrogant, and he runs some sarcastic stuff to them. Uh, uh, he has a lot of uh, statements in uh, the book of Galatians that are called Anacaluthons. They're texts that don't finish a sentence, and he's mad at the people who've been undermining his churches in Galatia. And uh, he goes into chapter five, I would that those people would castrate themselves. 
And, uh, and then uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except uh, Crispus and Gaius. And oh, uh, a few verses later, oh, uh, the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember if I did any more. That doesn't sound like a person who's consciously sitting down writing scripture, uh, but a person who is trying to deal in an ad hoc way uh, with circumstances that he's facing and his anger clearly shows in a number of those passages. Uh, the book of Re uh, Romans is far more uh, well planned out and uh, it's very much the same message as Galatians, but uh, the book of Romans was put together by Tertius, his secretary at the end, you'll see in uh, Romans 16 verse 22. And that's the, uh, uh, that's a big difference. Now, did Paul think this was scripture? Uh, he thought certainly he was writing according to the spirit. But if you use that model, which uh, Michael Kruger and Stan Porter and uh, Bokadal uh, use, uh, show me somebody who was telling the truth that didn't think they were speaking by the spirit in the first five centuries. And every council that met said they were uh, concluding by the spirit. They were led by the spirit to what they said. The leading of the spirit is a corollary. Surely uh, everybody that thought a book was uh, uh, come from God was scripture was they also believed that it was led by the spirit. But uh, there's a lot of people. Uh, Clement of Rome said he was led by the spirit to write. So did Ignatius as well. But we didn't include those in our New Testament. Uh, I think the motivation uh, for uh, did they think that they were writing scripture is becoming a popular notion these days, but it's clearly wrong, and there's no justification. And I've often said, as I shared with you a moment ago, if the New Testament writers thought they were writing scripture, you would think they would say it at least once, and they never do. Mm -hmm. And even now, the one book that comes closest to it, the book of Revelation, that uh, claims to be a revelation from God. And uh, it's the one book, and, and you can read right from the get-go, and at the tail end, it uses the Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4 uh, admonition not to touch anything in this book, or the plagues in the book will come in your direction. It's a judgment call. But the most disputed book in the New Testament in the early churches and for centuries was the book of Revelation. Uh, in other words, they didn't all think, uh, those who saw the book didn't all think it was sacred scripture. And it itself doesn't use the term scripture in reference to its writings. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've spent a fair amount of time, and uh, I have a summary of that in the, uh, the book that you uh, showed uh, a few moments ago, where I, I speak about that particular issue. Uh, the book uh, one of the books by one of the authors has me a quotation of me in every chapter, and then he goes through trying to show how uh, uninformed I am. But I think I've done my homework in that regard. Right, I'm sure. I'm sure you have. We know the Bible did not fall from the sky. Like it, it didn't just happen. Um, and uh, but most of us who have studied and read and loved the Bible through our, our lives have not necessarily considered how did this book even come to be? You know, it's, it's, we know it didn't magically appear, but, uh, but we don't really know the process. And, you know, you, you've got this book uh, where you've got a lot of books that you've, you've worked on and they probably have different processes, but in the modern publication era, you know, you write something, you query a publisher, you uh, get it written and edited, and and it's uh, out there for people to see, and it has a copyright 2020 date on it. It's pretty easy to follow. Uh, the Bible was not that easy. The, the New Testament was not that easy. Yeah, uh, the, how did it happen? <laughs> well, uh, you ask a, a very important, but also a very complex question. Uh, there were certain key elements, uh, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, that were right at the heart of the faith of uh, Judaism in the Old Testament, uh, the emergence of Judaism, uh, 
and uh, primarily the exodus and the wilderness wanderings and the entrance into Palestine. You'll find numerous uh, examples of that. There's about 85 of them uh, through the prophets, uh, major and minor prophets. And uh, uh, yet uh, uh, that particular story begins to expand and eventually it includes uh, not only the book of Genesis, but also the law. The law uh, came after uh, Abraham, uh, not before. And Abraham's faith is emphasized. And then the journey of the children of Israel from, uh, from Egypt uh, to the uh, Canaan, to the land of promise. Uh, in the New Testament, at the heart of early Christian belief was that Jesus was Lord, that he died on a cross for our sins. He was buried and raised again. And they even say he's coming again. And uh, those are very strong commitments. And that's the earliest tradition of the church. And the church would not have been formed had it not been for those fundamental foundational elements. All of the books that were written reflect that basic core of uh, uh, Christian belief. And uh, I, I'm currently writing a book on uh, the, before there was a Bible, early authorities, uh, uh, authorities in early Christianity. Uh, and that kind of a focus is the church existed before there was a Bible. Uh, and they existed because of an encounter with the risen Christ that was passed on to others and the teachings about him that circulated in early Christianity. Uh, and the authorities, by the way, were when the Christians gathered together, they rehearsed those things that was central to their faith. They put them in creedal form, and they also sang songs about them, and they were reflected at baptisms and at uh, uh, communion or the Eucharist uh, celebration for centuries before we ever got a Bible. So the early church was not absent from uh, the core traditions, and the books that were accepted were those that came closest to reflecting those early traditions. There were some books that didn't, and uh, in the second century, uh, one book is despised and rejected by uh, uh, Irenaeus. It's called The Gospel of Judas that got some attention a few years ago, but uh, it was rejected, and rightly so. It didn't cohere with the teachings that you find uh, in early Christianity that are reflected in the church fathers and also in the writings of the New Testament. Uh, but that was a long process for the New Testament to come into being, just like it was for what we call our Old Testament. Uh, there was a long period of assessment, but the core teachings that uh, reflected the, the faith of Judaism as well as early Christianity are reflected in the writings that did survive. Uh, we don't have uh, the term Bible that we are so used to uh, did not exist before uh, the ninth century in reference to a fixed collection of books. Though Jerome in the early fifth century spoke of uh, Ta Biblia, which is the books, and he was referring to the books that were sacred, and he had a list, but the lists themselves varied for uh, centuries right on up until the 19th century, by the way, uh, we sometimes forget, uh, we think that everybody, because today all major Christian groups, the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Protestants had the same New Testament, that wasn't true initially and for centuries. Uh, the Syrian churches uh, in the fourth century rejected what we call uh, they, uh, some scholars call it the Pocock epistles or the minor New Testament epistles. It's second Peter, uh, second and third John and Jude. And uh, they rejected those along with the book of Revelation. And that took place for quite some period of time. And they also accepted third Corinthians, uh, which is really a compilation of some of the texts that Paul wrote but, uh, and it also was trying to deal with some heresies in the second century. It was probably formed in the second century, but some thought it was sacred scripture and uh, included it for almost a thousand years on a number of manuscripts that circulated in Catholic churches in the West, but it was still called scripture until about uh, the early 1800s in Armenia. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, 
uh, uh, it and several other books are cited as scripture throughout church history. Uh, when the canon lists come out, they don't always exactly agree, and especially in which of the deuterocanonical or apocryphal uh, Old Testament books should be included. The Catholics differ from the uh, Orthodox in that regard, but that's also true in regard to the New Testament. It took almost 600 years for some of the churches in the East to welcome the book of Revelation, and the Orthodox churches to this day do not read it in their lectionaries and churches, even though they accept it as scripture. They do not read it. It's never found in their lectionaries uh, for readings uh, in their church uh, worship. Mm -hmm. So the process was a long time. Uh, I have shared with folks uh, uh, the first manuscript that shows all of the books of the New Testament and no others is at about 1000 AD. Hmm. And uh, now there's a fourth century manuscript, the Codex Sinaiticus that you may have heard about, uh, that has all of the books of the New Testament, but also the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermas. And there's no clear distinction between those texts within that, that volume. So you have a long history of that. I have often shared with uh, some of the uh, scholars that are working on this, you need to spend a lot of time in the manuscripts as well as the canon lists. They overlap considerably, but not precisely for centuries. Uh, they overwhelmingly accept the Gospels, overwhelmingly the Book of Acts, uh, 1 John, uh, 1 Peter, uh, and uh, the uh, letters of Paul, uh, most of the letters of Paul, seven of them at least, but the pastoral epistles have a little bit of a flaky history in terms of their acceptance. Well, those are the kinds of things that, that come out, and I've shared with people, look at the manuscripts that have survived antiquity. Those are the ones that were read in churches. What books are in them and what books are not? And uh, that varies for quite some period of time, and you'll find like in a, uh, it's about a, a third to fourth century document, P72, a papyrus text, uh, and it, it has not only, it's the oldest one we have of uh, Jude and First and Second Peter, and they come in that order, by the way, but they also have eight other books uh, in that same manuscript, including Third Corinthians and the 11th Ode of uh, uh, the Odes of Solomon, and uh, Psalm 33 and 34, and then the homily, uh, Melito's hom uh, uh, homily on the Passover. So, you'll find uh, very few people mention the books that are not biblical, that are in the manuscripts, uh, and you see that in the, the little foldouts in the Greek New Testaments uh, that we have. And not only the books, but also the very words. Uh, the uh, canon uh, uh, essentially is a focus on the books from a historical perspective, but scholars today are looking for the precise text. What did Jesus actually say, or Paul? And not all of them agree on all of the texts. There's a number of texts that we know that came into place. Um, very zealous scribes uh, wrote texts for, uh, or they made copies of the Christian scriptures. And if they said, and you can imagine this, I see this in church on Sunday mornings all the time, the pastor will give a Greek word, and he said, now it's translated this way, but it has this nuance, and it often assumes, and so did the scribes and the copiers, my audience won't understand this word, and so they will put a substitute word in that they think their audience will accept, or uh, that will also, uh, sometimes they add words to uh, reflect current teaching in the church. Uh, Jesus, John 3.13, said, no one has come down from heaven, or gone up to heaven, but he that came down from the heaven, even the Son of Man, and then in the King James Bible, it says, who is in heaven. The who is in heaven was trying to emphasize the omnipresence of Jesus because he was recognized as divinity, as God. And uh, so you find those texts that come out in the uh, King James Bible and other texts 
but uh, we're continually working on trying to get as close to the original text, but thus far we don't, we've not been able to achieve it. Um, the overwhelming majority of the text that we do have that we're certain about uh, goes right to the heart of the gospel and it doesn't change the gospel, but uh, the very words that are in the uh, manuscripts will vary. Uh, I've shared with people uh, there's 5,750, and it climbs almost every year one, by one or two, uh, New Testament manuscripts or fragments of them. No two are exactly alike. No two are exactly alike before the printing press. And even after the printing press, the scholars working on the text continually make changes. And so you'll see that in all of the modern translations uh, overwhelmingly, and people will ask me, which translation should I use? I said, the one you love the most. And uh, you're not going to hell because you read the King James Bible, but, uh, or any of the translations, there's some that are much better than others, but uh, the words in the text uh, vary uh, in all of the translations. There's no two translations alike, any more than two manuscripts. So uh, there's a complex history, but I don't think we need to worry because the basic core teachings that were circulating in the first century are still the same ones in the fourth and the fifth and the 20th century and the 21st century. Uh, we don't need to have too much concern about that. Uh, my colleague who helped uh, write that volume you showed, Craig Evans, has a movie out on uh, Jesus and a book, uh, Jesus and the Manuscripts, and he's being interviewed on that right now. The manuscript's core teaching is uh, pretty close to uh, uh, unanimous, but uh, sometimes scribes made changes to try to reflect the contemporary issues that they were facing, and that's why we need to look at the manuscripts. It gives us a wonderful history of early Christianity, but also uh, it lets us know that uh, most of the terms, most of the manuscripts where they have differences, there's about 200,000 uh, variants in the Christian manuscripts, at least. Uh, some scholars put it as high as 400,000 uh, variants, which is more than all of the words of the New Testament, by the way. But when a scribe was making a copy, he also brought himself to uh, the, uh, the copy. And if he thought his audience wouldn't understand, or he could add a, a line or a phrase or a couple of words to clarify things, that happened often. And I mentioned uh, Emmanuel Tove. I don't know if you know the name, but uh, uh, international director of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a wonderful Jewish scholar. And uh, I was giving a lecture on that uh, subject, uh, the variants in the manuscripts. And he came up afterwards and he said, Lee, there are over 900,000 in the Old Testament manuscripts. Wow. There's about 9,000 manuscripts and about 900,000 variants no two manuscripts are alike until the printing press. So mm. that's a long answer for, but you have a very good question uh, that came out. I hope I didn't muddy up the waters too much with folks, but I just underscore that it's a process that took a long time. We mm. often think, uh, and I even heard a pastor preach a few years ago when Paul traveled around uh, to various places preaching, he carried his Bible with him. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I, I had just taught a class on the canon for a group of graduate students, and they looked at me and I just smiled. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, anachronisms where we try to breathe what we know now back into the first century, mm -hmm. and it's not there. Whether uh, how the authors wrote uh, what they wrote and did they think they were writing scripture. The late second century fathers said, sure, yes, they were writing scripture. Uh, but then they debated which books were scripture for quite some period of time. There were some books widely welcomed, but second Peter, uh, second, third John, Jude, uh, Hebrews, Revelation, uh, the pastoral epistles, those are the books that uh, were questioned for quite some period of time. I like the, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the uh, beginning of the Christian communities. And they, um, they had 
stories of Jesus, uh, sayings of Jesus, but uh, one community might have what was what we now call uh, the Gospel of Matthew, but another community might have the Gospel of John. Say, um, did anybody have all four of them? Uh, very seldom do you find all four. Uh, there's a manuscript at the end of the second century, early third century. It's called P45, a papyrus manuscript, and it's uh, fragmented, but it has all four Gospels. And you will see by the end of the second century four Gospels, but when you look at the manuscripts, overall, they generally only have one or two, sometimes three, but seldom four. Uh, so the local church initially probably only had one gospel. And then uh, uh, when they heard about another one, they sent somebody to copy it and uh, they would, uh, uh, or they'd ask somebody to copy it and bring it to them. And so they would, might have two. But uh, most of the translations that we have that survive up through the fifth century AD only have one gospel in them, most of them, and uh, sometimes two or three. So that took a long time. But you can well imagine when Paul says, and uh, it's Colossians 4.16, uh, uh, have this manuscript, uh, have this text, my letter read also to the church at Laodicea and their letter to you. Well, we don't have that church uh, uh, of Laodicea epistle, but uh, uh, they were facing similar problems. And so what Paul said in the Colossian church would have been applicable uh, to another church. And so you do find uh, those kinds of things uh, were taking place. And somebody says, hey, we've got, we heard that you had a letter from Paul and uh, can we send somebody to Rome and make a copy of that? Sure. And those kinds of things happened for quite some period of time. And uh, there was a lot of translocal texts uh, in uh, the first century uh, a text could make it from one part of the Roman Empire to the other part within a matter of weeks uh, or even a month or something like that. So uh, they got circulated rather quickly. Some of the writings, like seven of the writings of Paul, were circulating, no doubt, by the end of the first century in some churches. And uh, mm. uh, you often find multiple copies of Paul's letters and one or more of the Gospels uh, circulating in the second century, and they're cited, uh, generally not as uh, uh, by the author like the Gospels. It's uh, Matthew's Gospel is copied uh, uh, three quarters of the time, are cited, but it, it's never as, according to Matthew, Jesus said, it's always Jesus said. So they mm -hmm. didn't focus on the, on the book, but on the person in the book and what that person said. So you do find that uh, that's a variance. Uh, only about the middle of the second century do you start hearing the gospels called the memoirs of the apostles. It's found in uh, uh, Justin Martyr's work, First Apology, chapter one. Anyhow, uh, that, uh, uh, I said chapter one, chapter 64 to 67, where the gospels are mentioned as memoirs of the apostles, but again, not by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You do see that by the end of the uh, second century AD. So there was a, um, a community of people that circulated writings and then somebody say, hey, I've got a letter from Paul and uh, would you like to get a copy? And uh, sure, send somebody over and we'll let you copy it. Sometimes they were pseudonymous texts and uh, in it, written in the name of Paul. And uh, there's a lot of that uh, apocryphal New Testament writings. There's uh, of the four Gospels that we have in our New Testament, there's at least 31 that didn't make it. And they're looked upon as pseudonymous texts, and a lot of them focused on like the childhood of Jesus or something. Wherever there's a gap in the Gospels, and we don't know much outside of Luke uh, beyond the time when Jesus was about 12, uh, his birth, and then the, about age 12 going to the temple, but there's others that fill in those gaps in the Protovangelium or the, uh, the gospel of Jesus' youth really uh, focuses upon uh, Jesus went down to a, uh, a water bed and formed out of clay 
pigeons clapped his hands and they flew away. Or another child bumps into Jesus and he drops over dead and his parents were upset about it and they are smitten with blindness. I mean, I'm glad we don't have that in our Bibles. But right. there are Gospels, there are Acts of Paul, Acts of Peter, Acts of uh, uh, Thomas, uh, I mean, you name it. Uh, there are a, a whole bunch of Acts that are not in our New Testament. And there's apocalypses also, uh, epistles that are attributed to different uh, prominent figures in the New Testament. And, uh, and there were four, uh, uh, three major apocalypses, uh, the one of John attributed to John and then uh, Peter and then the shepherd of Hermas. There are more copies of the shepherd of Hermas that survived antiquity than any of the books of the New Testament except the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John. So it was a very popular book, and it was included in the Codex Sinaiticus at the end of the fourth century. I don't know if I've strayed too far from your question, but... No, yeah. no, I, I think not. I, I think, I just think it's kind of fascinating to think that, um, you know, if you're in a community that only knows the Gospel of Mark, and then somebody brings in the Gospel of Luke, say, it's like, Wow, now we know the birth story. We know a little bit more about John the Baptist. We know the wise men story. You know, like a, different different gospels have different presentations, um, and that this community over here wouldn't know about the Annunciation, uh, but but this this other one did. So even though they were all Christian followers of Jesus, they mm -hmm. had. Kind of some differences. Uh, sure. Well, you you highlight a very good point. Uh, if they only had the Gospel of Mark and or the Gospel of John, they wouldn't know about the virgin birth. Right. And it's uh, the virgin birth is not included in any New Testament uh, creedal formulations. It's they're all largely focused on Jesus, with a couple of statements about God as Creator in Colossians 1.15 and 1 Corinthians, I think it's 8.6. And uh, uh, most of them are focused on Jesus. That continues in the second century, but they add the virgin birth. And that's because more people are now getting Matthew and Luke uh, around. And uh, also they're hearing uh, more about uh, uh, these other events and so the creeds begin to expand, but they don't expand beyond what the books uh, that the people had uh, by the late second century. Uh, you do see an emphasis on uh, God as creator, but that's following the Montanists uh, and the, I'm sorry, the, the Marcionites and the Gnostics in the second century that denied that God was involved in uh, a creation. Uh, that was a demon uh, a Craftsman, uh, Yaldabaoth uh, is a, a, a term that's used for that. But those kinds of uh, things began to emerge and the, the creeds would expand a little bit. One of the things that is not in creeds, and I haven't seen anybody else mention it, is there's no reference to a collection of books. But all of your modern creeds say these books and not those books and uh, uh, that's a modern invention, uh, really stemming from the time of about the 1500s uh, for the most part. But uh, creeds generally focused on Jesus, his identity, and what God is doing in the world and how we ought to respond or something of that nature. Um, uh, the second century uh, includes, at, toward the tail end, the role of the Spirit, and early third century as well. So uh, the creedal formulations remarkably never say the earliest ones anything about the scripture, but those teachings were passed on in the churches before they had a scripture. Uh, the early Christians, when they gathered together, didn't have most of the writings, uh, any of the writings of the New Testament. The earliest church didn't have any of those initially, but then, uh, but they had memory. And there were traditions that were passed on. And uh, I've shown uh, on several occasions the balance that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, where Paul speaks of the gospel that he received, that he's passing on to you, uh, uh, to them, uh, that Christ was uh, 
he died for our sins according to the scriptures, a threefold emphasis. And the next line is a one-fold entrance uh, 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 statement, uh, he was buried. And then you have another threefold, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and then a one-fold that he was seen, three one, three ones. Very easy. And then you have the list of witnesses that he was seen, first of all, by Cephas, and then the twelve. And then he was seen by above 500 brethren, and then he was seen by James and the rest of the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by Paul. And you have, again, the one, three, one, three. Very easy. If you get any of that mixed up, uh, I mean, it's easy for the churches to remember those things, and that's how they formulated them so they would be easy for memory. Mm -hmm. um, if I shared with you the parable of the prodigal son, and he came home and he practiced what he was going to say to his dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. You'd be with me right up to the point. And if I said, and his father said, son, get out of here. You have brought disrespect on our family. I don't want to see you anymore. You would say no. Right. But right. those are easy stories to remember. And while I may not have every word in it, the core of it doesn't change. And the elder brother if I said the elder brother praised the Lord that his brother had come home, you say, hey, no, no, no. Uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, that come out in that uh, that text. But yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm going too long here. But no, 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 no. no. I'm enjoying, yeah, I'm enjoying, enjoying it. Good. Uh, the, the, you mentioned uh, the Shepherd of Hermas in some other books that. that um, at one time, we were read as scripture in some churches. We included in the scripture centers. Um, but there must have been some criteria. Who established criteria that said, well, now, Hermos was good for its time, but not anymore. Yeah. Or other words. Very good. I, I've written on the criteria. Uh, and let me say right up front. There's no text in antiquity that tells us how the Bible was formed, none. And what we do is we draw inferences from what the church fathers say and how things were practiced in churches. The first thing that we know is if an apostle, if it was believed an apostle wrote it, then of course it was in. And uh, uh, that's why you have a, a, a large uh collection of writings in the names of their pseudonymous writings falsely put in the name of an apostle. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, the orthodoxy. There was the core traditions that were circulating in the church that we call the orthodox traditions. Christ died for our sins, was buried, raised again, and so on. Uh, if they cohered with that, they got in, and they were rejected if they didn't. Uh, and we can find church fathers that will reject them. Uh, the third is widespread use. And uh, the widespread use and uh, both uh, Origen in the third century and Eusebius in the fourth century emphasized uh, to uh, those that were reading their works that they should go to the books that are widely read and circulating uh, in their communities. And uh, then the uh, a fourth one is antiquity. Uh, the Muratorian fragment, uh, which I think is late fourth century, speaks about the shepherd of Hermas uh, shouldn't be read publicly, but it could be read and should be read privately because it was written in our times, not in the earlier times, the apostolic uh, community. So uh, those criteria, and then another one is called adaptability. Uh, was a text that was written uh, able to continue in the churches and show relevance to their own circumstances. We know some books that uh, didn't. Uh, Paul wrote some books that we don't have, and uh, they just ceased to be uh, to continue, like the letter to the uh, Laodiceans, or the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians is not our first Corinthians. And he speaks in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 about a text that he'd already written to them about. <clears throat> and, um, and they weren't following it, so he writes our 1 Corinthians. So there's a lot of uh, 
uh, writings that did not con continue, but some uh, were written in Paul's name and in Peter's name and in John's name. Those are very common names. And, uh, and those circulated as scripture for some Christians for a period of time. Uh, eventually that stopped, but uh, uh, First Enoch is still found in the Ethiopian Christian uh, canon. It, it's in their Bible. Uh, the third Corinthians continued for quite some period of time, but the early churches uh, had the core traditions, and I try to underscore that a lot because uh, that which cohered with that which is central to early Christianity, that didn't change much over the centuries for the majority uh, of Christians. There were fights and battles over the identity of Jesus. One of the things that I've underscored uh, several times is that the uh, uh, the books of the New Testament could never be settled before there was an agreement on who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And that was settled for most churches at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. But quite a few churches, of course, before then, uh, they didn't just invent orthodoxy at that time. There's what's called proto-orthodoxy, earlier formations of it, and you find it in the second century, you find it in the first century in the writings of the New Testament. The New Testament writings are simply passing on what was carried on and circulating in the churches mm -hmm. uh, for some period of time. So mm -hmm. no parallels to canon lists until after uh, Nicaea. Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea in 325 does not speak about any books that are accepted, but it's after that that the uh, canon lists begin to emerge and only local canon lists for councils uh, no ecumenical council of the seven major councils ever said these books and no others. And uh, the first time any uh, judgment was given about the books that are read is the Council of Trent in 1546. And it has uh, a condemnatory statement. If anybody doesn't accept all of these books, including their deuterocanonical or apocryphal books, uh, they are to be condemned. So that's, that's a part of the history of that, uh, of that focus, but it's just a just a isn't it, isn't it that, isn't that uh, it, 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 it's it's so long, long, long to say, say, this is, this is the, Bible. the Bible. Yeah, sure. And, 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 and you, you heard you mentioned something, you something I wasn't, I wasn't, I, wasn't with, with, I think it's called, I think it's called the pyramid. The, the what, I'm sorry? Paris. Paris. Oh, the Paris Bibles, sure. Uh, those really begin to emerge in about the 12th uh, century, 13th century, and uh, you get all of them. They were able to do something remarkable. Uh, they could put a, uh, uh, make their parchment papers very thin, their pages, and then they used uh, a new invention magnifying glasses that they were able to use. It's like glasses and they could write very small letters and uh, they uh, put together Bibles that were not uh, much bigger around than this book uh, here and they could be hand carried and those were all in Latin. And as a result, uh, they're called the Paris Bibles, but uh, those uh, texts had a significant influence for clergy and for professors and a few wealthy people that could own them. They were very uh, pricey uh, and up until the, uh, the printing press. So the Paris Bibles are really the first ones that begin to be called, well, it's about the ninth century AD when they start calling a collection uh, a Bible. Uh, the word Bible is a plural form of book, biblos uh, in the Greek. And ta biblia is the, uh, uh, the biblia is what you find uh, for the plural. And so when we speak of the Holy Bible, we're speaking of literally the holy writings and uh, it's writings plural. So it was a collection there, but these books and no others is a, uh, it takes a, quite a while for the church to say these books and no others. And when they began to say that, they didn't all agree. And uh, the hardest book was the uh, to be welcomed is Revelation. But there were some Christians in the fourth and fifth centuries that were welcoming uh, 
uh, First and Second uh, Clement as scripture, as well as the Psalms of Solomon and various other texts uh, that are found. Is there, is there value, value in, in, for today's days to read, to read any of these that, that the early the church, church you know, has scripture? Oh, uh, I think, uh, and I regularly say, uh, nobody will be going too far afield in a lot of these books uh, if they read them. What they do uh, help us know is how Christians were thinking uh, the synony pseudonymous uh, books, books written under a false name, uh, how the church was emerging and thinking at a certain period of time. And often they have the core values, but they add some other stuff that nobody else was adding, and that's why they were rejected, uh, or they contradicted some of the core teachings that were circulating in the churches. Uh, the I uh, strongly recommend people to read the um, what the Catholics call deuterocanonical books, and the Protestants call the apocryphal Old Testament books. Uh, that collection of writings, it's 10 books for the Catholics, sometimes 13, and it's three more for the Orthodox. Uh, there's nothing too wrong in them that you can't learn a lot, and they're the books that were written in what we now call the intertestamental period. They give us a much better picture. You cannot understand how uh, the circumstances developed in, in uh, Palestine without having first Maccabees close at hand and uh, some wonderful wisdom teaching found in the wisdom of Solomon and uh, also Sirach, the uh, uh, Jesus son of Sirach uh, is how the Hebrews speak of it. And that was a book that was uh, debated for quite some time, even by the Jews. And uh, they wanted to include it in their scriptures and they called it scripture up until about the fourth century AD. We have several examples of where the Jews called that uh, scripture. You learn an awful lot by reading those books and uh, some of them are inspirational like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'll think of it in a, in a moment, uh, Judith, uh, of course, and uh, uh, Tobias. Those are very inspirational uh, texts that focus on a hero and uh, people have cited those for quite some time. There's all kinds of questions about some books. How come these books got in and those didn't? And it was a college student that asked me that question that got me started on uh, uh, canon studies. He had taken a course at uh, Secular University and they said there are more books that didn't make it and did. And they're quite right. Uh, there's far more books uh, that uh, didn't make it than did. And that's when I started working on the area of criteria. And the student asked me in a church Bible study if uh, uh, the answer to that, uh, uh, to give an answer to that question. And as I was answering, I kept thinking of exceptions to everything I was telling them. And I said, can I get back to you uh, next week and I'm gonna do some homework. Well, I've been doing that now for almost uh, 38 or 39 years, but uh, and one of these days I'll get it right. I've had a fourth edition of my, uh, uh, two-volume work on canon, and I, I think I've come closer to the answering some of the questions, but there's a, a plethora of questions that come up, but I don't think there's uh, anything that uh, the people will find offensive, uh, too offensive. The um, second uh, Maccabees, uh, chapters, uh, 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 chapter 13 and 14, uh, Luther really objected to because it was a prayer for uh, uh, those who had died and as if something could be ha happen uh, and the Catholics picked up on that for purgatory. But a, a few texts like that uh, in there, but apart from that, uh, I think it's a very interesting reading. Um, I personally don't put it on the same level as I put uh, what we have in the Protestant Bible, but uh, uh, and those books are the same. All of the Christians accept the same books that are found in the Hebrew Bible, but they have them in a different order. And it's just the additional books uh, called the Deuterocanonical or uh, Apocryphal Old Testament books uh, that are in question. But I don't think anybody's going to 
fall apart at the seams on it. There's a lot more focus on those books nowadays than there was in the past. And if we can approach the Bible as if, uh, I, I've seen some churches, the very uh, uh, doctrinal statements for denominations, the very first statement has to do with the Bible, and then they get to God. And I said, somehow I was thinking God came before the Bible, but I could be wrong, but I need to check that out. And, and I said, the, the church existed before there was a Bible. Um, it, was, it was written by human beings, and they didn't all say exactly the same thing, but the core elements in there uh, largely are supportive of one another. And I, I, I welcome them and uh, preach and teach them uh, when I can hope, hopefully live by them. But I don't, uh, uh, I can't follow some of the rigid things that you and I had, you had talked about the inerrancy issue. How do you deal with inerrancy when none of the manuscripts have the same words? And inerrancy says not one word. You know, it's verbal plenary inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, gee, uh, if that's true, which one of those manuscripts is the inspired one and all of the others aren't? Uh, uh, sometimes we get our language caught up and uh, I've uh, spoken about the syllogisms that are used. Uh, God is perfect, absolutely. God inspired the Bible, you betcha. Therefore, the Bible's perfect. And there's another syllogism and that one ignores uh, and that's used still now, I hear it uh, from time to time. That's used as a justification for a perfect Bible, but nobody qualifies, uh, and everybody that uses that perfect or inerrant has to qualify it. It's died the death of a thousand qualifications, you've probably heard. But there's another syllogism, uh, to be human is to err. The Bible was written by humans, therefore the Bible has errors. What's wrong with both of the syllogisms is that neither deals with the text of the scriptures. They make assumptions, and uh, then they try to make sure that everything fits within those assumptions, and then they're doing uh, handstands trying to figure out how many times the cock crowed and uh, uh, when uh, Peter was denying Christ or uh, trying to figure out how to harmonize the chronicles with the kings and the numbers of troops, and there's a host of those things. I don't waste my time doing that. And uh, did Matthew get uh, cite a different book uh, than what he, he cited a text, but gave it to a different book. And so did Mark uh, at the beginning of the uh, Mark chapter one. Uh, I don't get too carried away with that, but uh, the Bible is a marvelous book and we would be at a greater loss without it, but the earliest churches didn't have it. Yeah. But I, when I was, uh, what motivated me in writing a new book on uh, early Christian authorities before there was a Bible, uh, I was in church. And all of a sudden, throughout the whole service, they were singing songs that emphasized the core teachings of early Christianity. And uh, the had a communion service and they cited uh, what Jesus said on those moments and they're the very words of Jesus that Paul has in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and I said, gee, that's how the early Christians did it. And then I saw baptism where persons are confessing their faith in Christ as Lord and uh, uh, welcoming his forgiveness of sins and so on. And I said, you know, uh, that's how the early church did it. And they sang songs, uh, their uh, uh, preaching, their teaching, their singing, their uh, activities, whether baptism or communion, uh, that carried the day and not much varied after that. And the books that we have simply reflect those primary uh, traditions. Yeah. So